So thank you to uh, Nathan and, and the uh, workshop organizers. It's a great opportunity to come together and, and share knowledge on this important topic. I've been working in this area for 30 years and I'm always learning, so that's a good thing. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is about a project that we developed in northwestern Alberta, Tolco developed in northwestern Alberta. Uh, we call it the Northwest Alberta Collaboration Project. The goal of the project was to explore and pursue a new relationship between First Nations and Tolco for the benefit of all. Uh, Jacob earlier introdu introduced one of my idols, who's Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the world. Is 89 years old, his business partner Charlie Munger is 95. Every year Warren and Charlie make a point of sharing mistakes they've made in the previous year with their shareholders. So Warren likes to talk about mistakes and learnings. This year, this is from this year's quote, so he's 89 and he's still learning. Um, so he says, if you played golf and you hit a hole in one on every hole, nobody would play golf, it would be no fun. So he says, you gotta hit a few in the rough and then get out of the rough and that's what makes it interesting. So for the past 30 years, I've been playing golf, metaphorically speaking working on First Nations issues, and I continue to hit the ball in the rough. So we'll share some of those learnings as we explore this project. Um, back in 2016, uh, if you've been doing this for a long time, like Peggy and I, you hear concerns raised by communities, um, um, similar concerns over the years. I've had the privilege of working across North America and hearing things from communities from the Seminole in Florida uh, to the Innu in Labrador um, up to northwestern Alberta and British Columbia. And I hear similar connections to the land, the importance of culture, the importance of learning from elders, the importance of engaging youth, um, challenges around capacity building, loss of culture, these types of things. And similar, Tolko has been operating in northwestern Alberta for many years and we've heard these challenges and so we thought well, let's take the opportunity to reset and sit down with the chiefs and see if we can take a new approach to, to things. So we set out in 2016. Uh, we negotiated a letter of intent with the four First Nations that we work with regularly in high-level Alberta where we have a sawmill. Um, Beaver First Nation, Dene Ta First Nation, Little Red, and Tall Cree. And I acknowledge Matt Munson's here from Dene Ta today. Um, and each of those nations belong to the North Peace Tribal Council, so we worked with the Tribal Council to negotiate a letter of intent. Uh, we signed this letter of intent in May 2016, so this is a picture of the chiefs and the CEO of the Tribal Council and our CEO, uh, Brad Thorlickson. Uh, it's a private family-owned company. Uh, Brad's the president and CEO. So this is a chief-to-chief -chief moment, uh, signing of a letter of intent moving forward. Uh, we aimed high. We have Tolko, uh, if you look at the blue FMA in this area, uh, you'll see, and then there's a number of uh, other forest management areas that uh, either have direct interests or indirect interests of each of the four First Nations that I talked about and or they have tenure and volume in those areas. We thought, what if on this 5.7 million hectares, we could work collaboratively together to achieve new things? We worked with the chiefs to design a plan. Um, they signed off on the plan. Um, my boss, Bob Fleet, who's the Vice President of Environment and Forestry, uh, took responsibility from Brad to oversee this and help move this project forward. We agreed to explore and pursue, and we chose this wording very carefully. Explore and pursue gives you the opportunity to have heated discussions, walk out of the room, think about things, come back, and continue to explore and pursue. You're not putting necessarily anything on the table. This is not consultation. This is something we talked about in a lot of detail, but it gives you the opportunity to put things on the table, whether you're the First Nation or the company or some of the partners that we brought into the tent later on. We wanted to develop a joint administration approach to forestry, which would either in reality or digitally combine these tenures, the thought being that the sum of the parts would be greater than each individual piece from an economic perspective, from a stewardship perspective, and from a First Nations values perspective. Can we bring these disjointed squares and work on a large landscape and achieve some real goals? 
Uh, we chose to explore and pursue policies in areas such as revenue sharing, forestry operations, environmental and wildlife protection, conservation, and of course, uh, res respecting treaty and Aboriginal rights, which we've talked about a lot this morning. We wanted to explore and pursue an approach to free prior and informed consent, which Jacob and Peggy spoke to earlier today, and we wanted to develop a stewardship plan for this area. You'll notice, and I'm not going to try and say it every slide, on the bottom of every slide it says explore and pursue. That became our mantra. It's something that we, we took very seriously. Um, we changed a lot of things since 2016. Uh, you'll look at the bold text on the right of the screen, I guess. Uh, we applied for free of money to, um, for the North, through the North Peace Tribal Council to ex examine First Nations values. Um, we've heard from a lot of speakers today how important it is to have those values um, documented and recorded and, and brought forward. That would, for us, bring together a key component of addressing land use on this 5.7 million hectares. We sought and secured over $2 million worth of funding to support the project. So we had our leadership sign on, we had big bucks, and we brought this forward. And we wanted to move um, away from what some have described as very hostile relations between TOLCO and the First Nations engaged and to a very much more proactive approach um, and getting away from our business as usual. Some of the accomplishments are on the left-hand side of the screen. We explored MOUs with each of the First Nations, which get into things like education, training opportunities, economic activities. Um, we explored volume agreements with each of the First Nations, uh, depending on where they sit on the landscape and their ability to engage, um, and looked at shifting TOCO volume over to the First Nations for business and economic purposes. One of the key pillars of our approach, remember the three pillars are economic, stewardship values, conservation values, and First Nations values. We brought together a stewardship table. So first of all, Tolko's just one licensee in the area. There's others. Um, we thought that environmental groups would add value to this process. So we sought the support of our First Nations partners to invite environmental groups into the table, uh, which we did. Uh, so CPAWS was at the table, uh, Docs Unlimited, Stand, and International Boreal Conservation Campaign. Um, you can see that the First Nations were on this stewardship table at a technician and a director level from the Lands Department. Um, we had North Peace Tribal Council representatives at the table. The government of Alberta was invited as observers um, and to provide knowledge to us. Um, so you can see a number of individuals both from Ag4 and, and, um, and the wildlife side of things um, from the government of Alberta. And then we had a team of five people at one point from Tolco. Um, and some others beh behind the scenes helping move the work of the stewardship table forward and other aspects. On the stewardship side, we wanted to document um, uh, the wildlife values in this 5.7 million hectares from a scientific and traditional lands perspective uh, and get that information on the table. The species at risk is obviously a huge concern. We've heard questions about caribou today. I'm going to talk about caribou a little bit. Um, but also bison and sandhill cranes and other species that were of value to First Nations. All the elements of what the stewardship table talked about was agreed to by all the participants at the table. This takes time. So simply put, we would take the forestry values, the traditional uh, land use values, the wildlife values, and the economic values on the left-hand side of the screen, dump those into some black boxes that foresters like to play with and, and others, GIS folks, um, and come out with a stewardship plan, and then ultimately the stewardship plan would inform our forest management plan. We actually did this. Uh, we've created a stewardship, what we call the interim stewardship plan. Uh, it gets mapped. It's uh, distributed across all the values are, are shown and mapped, like some of the values that you've seen projected here today. Uh, we would take these, pro these maps and bring them to the communities. We made an effort to visit each of the First Four Nations communities. Um, we always tried to have an interpreter available so people could speak Cree or Beaver uh, or Dene if that was their desire. Uh, we didn't want to do everything in, in English. Um, we had some really fun and great meetings doing this. It was a fantastic learning experience for, for me and, and as well for the elders. You would see 
elders talking about a, a creature and they, they would struggle and they'd want to show it and so some young person would whip out their iPhone and they'd go, is this it? <laughs> and they'd go, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's here, that's here. Um, so we were able to get that type of interaction across generations and between forestry professionals um, and First Nations individuals. Uh, and it was, it was quite, um, it was very cool. It was a, a great experience. Um, the chief signed off on the interim stewardship plan, um, and again, we're exploring and pursuing concepts and trying to move this forward. Um, like any governance thing, you come up with Gantt charts and timelines. Uh, you present that to your body, the, in this case, the chiefs overseeing things and, and directors and so forth, and you get buy-in to the timelines and things. Um, we do hit the ball into the rough, so to speak, occasionally, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but again, we did value the importance of community meetings. This is just a photo from, and we would, we would couple our efforts with other efforts. So North Peace Tribal Council had a housing meeting, which I believe this photo was taken at. Believe me, stewardship doesn't get this kind of interest. <laughs> Um, so we coupled our, we, we would build our stuff into other community meetings that were going on um, and then take the opportunity where communities were getting together to talk about other stuff. Uh, we would tip back in on the tail end. We did something similar this summer with Beaver First Nation. They were doing um, a youth engagement project on green living and we got invited to present and we brought, again, we brought a bunch of TOCO staff there. We talked about human resources opportunities. We talked about land management. We au auctioned off a chainsaw. Um, we did, we went in all in. <laughs> so it was fun. Um, you got to engage government. I mentioned before some of the people at the executive director, director and technician level who participated at the table. Um, but we also made sure that we were going up to the assistant deputy ministers and talking to them and informing them. We would go with TOCO staff, my boss at the VP level, as many chiefs as we could get into the room at the same time, usually two, um, and then we would invite our environmental uh, organization partners and, and go talk to government. Um, and we, so you can see that we've talked to a number of agencies, we would talk to MLAs in the area um, and engage people in the process and make sure they were informed to the extent possible. Um, caribou is a big issue across the boreal forest in Canada. There's a federal recovery strategy and we were asked by the government of Alberta to engage in the caribou range planning process in July. Uh, we put that before our stewardship table and came up with some recommendations from that group. Again, if you look at this table, we've got some pretty good engagement. We've got TOLCO there. We've got the First Nations, North Peace Tribal Council, four environmental groups, but that's not all the land, land users, obviously. Um, and again, government was participating, but we didn't have oil and gas and we didn't have municipalities at this time. In 2000, so we did work in 2017 on caribou. In 2018, we were asked again uh, to participate in caribou range planning, more specifically on the Bishjo range. We spent a lot of time uh, working as a table with maps, looking at data, uh, working with our government of Alberta partners um, and we needed to crack that nut of broader stakeholder engagement. And so there was some shuttle diplomacy, uh, lots of phone calls behind the scenes. We engaged with the municipalities in oil and gas uh, individually. Uh, and then we were able to get folks into the room on two occasions uh, to share knowledge. Um, the stewardship of table eventually submitted a document to the government of Alberta called some necessary and required key elements uh, for the Bishjo Caribou Range. So what that kind of means is we didn't get consensus on the whole document that we were working on, but we were able to get consensus on some very important high-level parameters, including some big ticket items like protected areas and conservation zones and no harvest zones, those types of things. Um, more broadly, uh, just kind of summing up here quickly a little bit, um, We've completed a, a bunch of work across uh, the table. I talked about a little bit of it already. Um, we got endorsement of what we call the interim stewardship plan. Uh, we held community meetings with each of the four First Nations. This included land users, trappers, elders, counselors, uh, doing all that work in English and, and 
the First Nations language, we obtained significant funding to move the program forward. Um, we completed uh, over the course of two years detailed conservation value work. Um, so we have looked at literally hundreds of species using the tech combined knowledge of CPAWS and Ducks Unlimited Canada, um, some high tech mapping um, and GIS work to complete detailed conservation values mapping for 5.7 million hectares. Uh, we also got on the ground. Um, we started an inventory of seismic lines in the lower portion of the Vistio range, looking at which seismic lines need to be restored um, and how to do that. We collaborated with Dene Ta and CPAWS uh, to submit a proposal uh, for the entire Vistio range um, where we would look, work collaboratively between Tolko, CPAWS and, and Dene. Um, and we included some municipalities in that work as well. Unfortunately, we didn't win that bid. Um, we had a lot of consultation money in there, uh, or sorry, community engagement money in that proposal, and we lost out. So we've launched economic opportunities. We've launched timber harvest programs with uh, three of the four First Nations, uh, one of which was already existing, but we've continued on. Uh, Bend and Break, Jacob from Alpac talked about this earlier this morning. The photo on the screen is actually a photo of Bend and Break. So Jacob highlighted earlier uh, when we want to get conifers on the, back on the landscape, um, you need to work on, on the uh, deciduous competition. Very briefly, what you do is you take a long saw, this is hand, hand work, take a long saw, cut a third of the way through the stem and bend it over. We do one meter radiuses uh, around each of the crop trees. Um, we have, this is a photo from a trial program um, but we went all in in this summer uh, and did brand and break on uh, just under a thousand hectares, I believe. Um, created significant employment amongst the First Nations. Uh, we did a First Nations employment training camp. I think um, one of the, sp um, the speaker was on fire was talking about the importance of getting other skills. So she's doing fire, but she's doing chainsaw management and first aid. We did the same thing on our bend and break program. So we were training uh, youth uh, or others to, you know, they're not only learning about bend and break, they got their driver's license, they learned some basic work skills, uh, got their quad training, got their first aid training, those types of things. Um, on bend and break, Tolko is committed to a two-year moratorium, not only on the use of herbicides in this area, uh, but also our ripper plow, plow activities. I actually had a good photo. We went and did a, a site visit with a, a, each of the First Nations uh, ripper plow, we know, has been on the landscape for many years. We went to 30-year-old blocks, 20-year-old blocks, 10-year-old blocks, last year's blocks, um, and talked about what does ripper plow look like, what does herbicide look like, and then went and saw bend and break and saw bend and break on the ground. I'm a wildlife biologist and an anthropologist by training. Uh, science is near and dear to my heart. Herbicide has a role on the landscape. I've also talked to First Nations communities across North America. Foresters, you're going to have to use some other tools. <laughs> herbicide is not the answer. You're not going to win the hearts and minds of First Nations people and the public with herbicides. Um, so this is a tool, and we're going to continue to use that. Um, and we, so that moving on from bend and break, we continue to engage on the Bistro Caribou Range Recovery Strategy. So I said you do hit the ball into the rough. We went into the rough. Um, in September of this year, the chiefs sent us a very brief letter, said thank you for your work on the Northwest Collaboration Project, we are no longer engaged. Uh, their stated concern was that after three years of a lot of work by themselves and Tolko and others, uh, that we had not reached legal agreements to continue the mandate of the table. And so we accept that decision from the chiefs. It's a hard message to receive. Um, we feel, and I think this is shared by others at the table, that we've expanded our knowledge. We expanded our knowledge on traditional land use. We expanded our knowledge on uh, creating relationships. Um, we built good partnerships with First Nations, with governments, agencies, uh, and learned a lot. And we're going to continue to work that way. Um, we're committed to work bilaterally with each of the First Nations. Those relationships still go on. Um, and so when you hit it into the rough, you hopefully look back at your swing and 
think about things you could have done differently. We placed a heavy emphasis on the stewardship table in the last two years, um, and even though we made uh, significant achievements in the economic area, that was probably not to the liking of the chiefs, I'm speculating. Um, stewardship is super important to First Nations communities, Aboriginal and treaty rights are as well, obviously, but economic gains and more meaningful engagement in the sector is also important, and getting potentially distracted uh, by conservation in caribou took time and maybe watered down some of our efforts in some of those other areas. Um, the chiefs aren't always available to engage in these things as much as they say they would be. We had stellar first class help at the stewardship table. As TOLCO, we didn't put that same emphasis on getting the same degree of dev engagement at a sort of a technical level, at a director's level. Um, and that, I think, was a misstep on our part, and we lost the engagement of the chiefs. We could have better ensured adequate financial support for all parties. We secured a lot of money for this project. Uh, we did what we thought was a first-class job. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts when you have that much money. Not all that money was in the control of TOLCO hands, um, and one of our partners wasn't able to meet some of their commitments uh, in their funding. Um, and in certain respects, TOLCO didn't catch that or help catch that, um, and that partner lost their funding and wasn't able to participate in the table, and that came as a bit of a surprise to us. Um, so we could have worked more closely with that partner to ensure uh, that that funding was uh, secured uh, more adequately. Um, community outreach, I thought we did a great job on community outreach. I actually, I don't know why I put that there other than engagement of the chiefs. I think we did... Uh, and our partners on the First Nations did a good job of engaging the communities. So I guess for me, uh, getting back and reporting to the chiefs was a key piece that we could have done better. Uh, let's see, sorry, <laughs> I lost the slides there for a sec. So it's a great project, we've learned a lot, um, and we'll continue to take those learning forwards. Um, and that is the end of my slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.